Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Sunday program for the Church of the Eternally Secure. <laughs> Woo I'm so happy to be here today. I was talking to Brother Matthias before we went live and kind of complaining about not feeling a, a very energetic today. But all of a sudden, I just feel empowered. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I guess uh, talking to Renee and uh, Matthias is, uh, you know, just also uh, strengthens me. So uh, let's uh, let's get started with our program. Uh, before we get into the uh, the, the study, uh, let's uh, have Renee and Matthias say hi to everybody. Let's start with Sister Renee, our untwisted sister. Hey guys. Hey. Happy to see everybody. Uh, my channel is just simply Renee Roland. And uh, like everyone else on the panel, I contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And I come against any scripture that's twisted that uh, others use to imply that we must work to keep, get or maintain or prove our salvation. Um, because I, I, I want people saved and there's only one way and that's through God's grace, uh, through faith. So... Uh, that's what I do. I fight for the gospel and uh, untwist the twisted scriptures. Thus, my term of endearment from Luke. <laughs> Good to see you guys. All right. Uh, yeah, some people wouldn't understand that if they don't uh, have the history of the uh, that rock group that the Twisted Sisters. Uh, I think that was the name of the group, wasn't it? The Twisted Sisters, or is that the name of one of their songs? <clears throat> but uh, okay, uh, Matthias, uh, uh, tell the viewers in case someone doesn't know about Talk on Doctrine what you do. Right. Well, on Talk on Doctrine, we just have a bunch of Bible studies and panel discussions, some one on one talks, and really just try to bring the chat room, bring them and have them involved in pretty much all of the broadcasts as well. So if anybody ever wants to have a discussion live on air and you have a topic, let me know and uh, we'll schedule it in and uh, and do that. But we've got pretty much broadcast every week or every day of the week, except for Wednesdays usually. Uh, so check us out if you haven't. Uh, it's very interactive, so you'll enjoy it. Amen. Uh, yeah, I can certainly uh, recommend you. Uh, Go to talk and doctrines programs, uh, particularly if you're, you're someone who uh, wants to do more than just listen. You actually want to get involved in the conversation. It's a it's a platform that gives you that opportunity. Um, now we know that Brother Daniel is on vacation, so we'll, we all keep him and his family in our prayers for a safe um, and wonderful vacation. Uh, well, it'll be the three of us, unless uh, uh, Brother Michael. Is able to join us. I sent him the link, and uh, maybe he'll be joining us at some point today. I hope so. Um, all right. Uh, first, let me just say, if, if you're new to this program, uh, I want to welcome you. I hope that you enjoy the time with us today. We do this every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We also have a Wednesday night Bible study at 6.30. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to use Eastern Time. 9.30 Eastern Time on Wednesday nights. Uh, we just started uh, teaching on the first Corinthians uh, and uh, then Friday nights we have a program called Fellowship Friday and in that and that uh, program it's different in that I put the link publicly so anybody who agrees with our core doctrines uh, can click on that link and join the panel as part of the, the live discussion but the Friday night program is not really a study format it's just a time of fellowship and uh, praising Jesus together. Uh, we're having a real good time on Friday night, so I hope you'll join us. Uh, now, uh, the next thing we want to do is, uh, uh, I, I don't really have any announcements I can think of right now. Uh, Renee or, or uh, Matthias, do you have any announcements you need to make? Uh, no, not right now. Okay. Uh, all right, then the next thing are our prayer requests. Uh, I have no new prayer requests sent in at this time. Um, so um, uh, unless 
somebody in the chat room or Renee or Matthias has some prayer uh, needs that you need to bring to our attention, let, let me know. I got I got a couple of viewers. Um, little Gordon, you know, I did a prayer video for him last night. He had some kind of growth on his throat and he was suicidal the other night. Uh, I think he tried to commit suicide. He's been sent home now. Um, so we want to keep him in prayer. That spirit of suicide that Michael was talking about seems to be prevalent in the church right now. Uh, and we want to keep Anthony Suarez in prayer. He's still waiting on a kidney transplant. Um, uh, Karen Matthias had surgery recently, so I just want to lift her up again. And also to continue praying for Manly Moses Shore that he get a miraculous uh, cancer report. Uh, because I want him and his son saved. They're both Jews. One of them is an atheist Jew. Sounds ironic, but it is. So I uh, just want to keep those people in prayer. And uh, Daniel, while he's on vacation, let's keep him in prayer for safe travel. All right. Right. You, you, didn't, you didn't mention yourself, uh, Renee. Uh, uh, I, everybody would like probably like to know uh, your, uh, how you're feeling now. I, I'm... I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, I need that my mouth surgery, but as far as my health goes, that bones moved off my nerves, so I'm able to walk pretty good. The pain is manageable, so I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, since we brought up that subject, uh, the uh, the medical uh, needs you have there, uh, and that we do have a uh, a site where you can donate to that cause. Uh, if you go back a couple of videos of mine. You'll see a video titled, uh, what was that? What did I title it? Smiling for Smiles for the Gospel, I think, or something like that. Smiles for the Gospel. It's a, it's a three minute video I made, and it's, it's, it's to tell you about going to it on a link so you can see the, uh, the website that was formed to or help raise the money for uh, Sister Renee's needs. So if you're not aware of that, uh, go back and and uh, look into that, please. Uh, there's been a lot of progress on that, so I'm um, thank you to everybody for for helping. Uh, Matthias, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, um, that uh, pray for Daniel's church family, and then also for Miss Connie's immediate family. Uh, Miss Connie died this morning, so for the. For the most part, um, she had a great confession. So from my understanding, she's with the Lord. So praise God for that. We just really need to keep those who she was near and dear to keep them in prayers. Uh, but also for uh, Shabbat Sadna, spiritual warfare in India, which is a, a pretty pretty aggressive spiritual warfare place so asking for prayers from the chat room for that uh jesus is lord needs prayers for cancer and heart problems and uh his mother or her mother uh, i think his mother along like many of our families are dealing with devils so please keep them in prayers um continued prayers for frank b uh, he's struggling with certain things, and God knows what. He was asking for continual prayer back on Friday. And I think that that is what we have in the chat room for right now. If I missed any, I apologize. But I, I think that's the prayer request we have in the chat. All right, good. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of prayer needs that are new that were brought up each week, and uh, the Lord remembers them, so let's just keep praying. Uh, uh, I, I know the Lord is omniscient and know, knows all these needs and, uh, and uh, is not going to forget them. Uh, so I pray every day that the Lord will, will say yes to these, the needs of this congregation, all, all the needs that are on this kind of prayer list that we're we're talking about <clears throat> so uh, whether it's a brand new need or something that's been going on for some time the lord knows okay let's do this now and uh we're going to take about 30 minutes of silence and ask the congregation to pray for all these needs now
All right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I, you know, I've had a lot of prayer needs uh, over the last this last year, but uh, I'm I'm just thankful that uh, so many of the needs have been met, and that um, I'm feeling so well. I just, I just, my prayer is, is thank you, thank you, Lord, for everything He He does for me and for all of us. Um, all right. Uh, now, normally at this time, uh, we would have Brother Daniel uh, do some uh, music, uh, praise and worship music for us. We'll have to miss that this, this time. Um, I think he's going to be gone a couple of Sundays. Uh, uh, so uh, we can get right into the discussion part of the program. And uh, I, I'm still getting questions every day. I got a couple more today from Patrick Stepp. I haven't even been able to even look at those questions. I just know he's asked them. So, But uh, all the new questions are added to my list, and they go at the bottom unless I feel that it's, it's so urgent it has to be moved forward. Uh, we got a lot of lists, so I just ask everybody, please be patient uh, and know that I'm not losing your questions or forgetting them. Um, I, uh, we will get to them. It's just we need a little bit of time to get around to this long growing list. Okay, so the first question uh, we're going to address today is from Nicholas Parson. And Nicholas wrote, um, Hi Luke, my name is Nick. I'm 16 years old. And I asked you a question on YouTube. My name on there is Nicholas P. And the picture is a cat. But anyway, you told me that you were going to ask the Sunday panel on Sunday, June 16th, but you never did. It's okay. I'm not mad. I understand completely. It's fine. But I would still like to know the answer to my question. My question is this. Does one have to believe in the deity of Christ to be saved? I believe so. What is your thoughts on this? That is my question, so simple, but I can't get peace over it. My mom believes that Jesus died for her sins, burial, and resurrection, but she does not believe in the real Jesus. She believes in another Jesus. And that false Jesus that she believes in is just the Son of God, but not God. She believes Jesus is not God in the flesh, but, it, but is she still saved? I sadly believe not, because in John 8, 24, states that if you... You must believe that Jesus is God, uh, not just the Son of God. Uh, but this troubles me because I don't have peace over it. I did in the past, but now it's troubling me again because I am scared that I am adding to the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I hope to God that I'm not believing in another gospel like it says in Galatians 1.8. All I hear is just believe on the finished work of Christ and you will be saved. But you've got to believe in Jesus too, right? And not a false one, the real one. I can never get an answer. I am in agony all the time as soon as I put my hand down and, I, and as soon as I wake up and I'm thinking about it, I'm suffering because I can't get the truth. I never have peace over it. But my greatest fear is that I don't have salvation because I'm perverting the gospel. I don't believe I am. Please, 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 please help me. Thank you and God bless. Uh, wow. uh, let me emphasize a couple of points and then ask uh, Renee and Matthias to respond first. But uh, so the question in his case is not. Uh, does he have to believe it? Because he does. He, 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 it's not a question of him not believing it. He's worried for his mother and others who don't believe in, in the deity of Christ. But he's also worried about himself is that if believing in the deity of Christ is not necessary to be saved, then uh, he's afraid that him adding that uh, is uh, perverting the gospel and he's uh, making that violation. So, uh, all right. Uh, I don't know who wants to go first on this. Start uh, talking. If you don't mind, I, I will. Uh, first of all, you're not believing another gospel, um, so don't worry about that. This is a truth that I believe the Holy Spirit will reveal to people. Uh, I'm shocked how people can believe the gospel and then deny that Jesus was pre-existing or eternal 
or was God himself with there's so many verses saying that he created the world. He had glory with the father before the world was that he came down from heaven. So I, I don't know how people don't come to that conclusion. But John 8, 24 says something here. And the word he is italicized. It was not in the original. The he was put there for uh, understanding. So in John 8, 24, he said, I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Now, the uh, King James Version says, for if you believe not that I am, and then it says italicized, he. So he is italicized, meaning it was not in the original Greek manuscript, but it was put there for clarification. So Jesus is saying, and if you don't believe that I am the promised one, the son of the living God, the Christ, you will die in your sins. So believing who Jesus is, we're warned, Paul warns about another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Uh, you're not adding to the gospel when you say to believe in the deity of Christ. I don't underestimate God's mercy on these issues, but I don't know how a person can believe on Christ and not believe in the right Christ. So I, I can't know 100% sure if somebody can be saved and not understand that he pre-existed and that he's divine. Uh, because Paul preached that he is the name above all names. He is the Lord. So if you don't acknowledge that, Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am the I am, of the Old Testament, you shall die in your sins. So um, I, I think a person needs to know who Jesus is. I don't know how you have a relationship with someone you don't know or how you have a relationship with someone and they aren't who you think they are. So I don't underestimate God's mercy, but I think this is something, it's a core foundational truth and the Holy Spirit should be bearing witness to this truth. So if I were you, I would just pray that your mother be revealed this truth. That That's what I would do. But you're not preaching another gospel. I, I do not believe that. All right. Thank you. Matthias? All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I concur. Um, you're definitely not preaching another gospel. Uh, but... I will go I will go as far as saying that if somebody does not understand the deity of Christ, if they don't know that God himself is the only savior there is, they they don't have the right Jesus and they can't be saved. Now, really understanding about his pre-existence and all that, I mean, that's like diving in and, you know, digging deep into scriptures. You, you don't have to really grasp that necessarily, but understanding that he's more than just the son of God or really what the son of God actually means, not the son of Adam. We're all sons of Adam. So we are Adams. We are men and women in your mother's case, but uh, a son of God, the son of God, is God. So understanding that it truly is him, uh, that you have to know that it, it is he, like what Renee said, they, the he is italicized in um, John 8, 24. And I think it's, uh, it reads <clears throat> better. I think it reads better if it just stated, here, let me go ahead and pull it up real quick. Uh, 8, 24, I think it reads better I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. The I am, the great I am, I am that I am, is my Abba. Uh, and so with uh, believing that it's he, I would say that, yes, you have to. Um, even in Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Um, 
you have to know who God is and he is Jesus Christ. So in order to have the right God, and if you look to the Old Testament, the God of my rock and I, in him I will trust, he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior, thou savest me from violence. That's Second Samuel 2, or Second Samuel 22. Um, if you look in the Old Testament, O God of Israel, the Savior, not a Savior, it's capital S. So it's not just in the New Testament that we that we get that God is the actual Savior. Now, you're not preaching another gospel, but as long as you don't know that you're not preaching another gospel, just keep seeking. You're pre you're saying the right stuff, but do you know that you know that you know that what you're saying is real? That's what true belief in is. So you, I'm not saying that you don't believe. I'm just saying that there'll come a time when you won't have to ask these questions because the understanding will come from the Holy Spirit given. Now, you gave a lot of scriptures in your question, which is awesome. Stay with it. Just stay in the word of God and keep asking the questions, keep fellowshipping with everybody, uh, but um, just keep seeking. And for your mom, we'll all be praying for her. But right now, don't, don't think that there's a false hope that somebody could be saved without having that understanding that the Holy Spirit provides. It is something to, uh, a hurdle to get over. Uh, that flesh is really hard to do. Can't. But also there's people who do believe in the deity of Christ who they're not even saved. So you can get a taste of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost can give you some truth and you can accept it, reject it, uh, and move forward or not. But um, the deity of Christ is its one of the essentials of the faith. Um, I believe I call it the truth. Uh, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the only way to the Father. No religion or works. That's one of the essentials. The truth that God himself came down and became man, lived a perfect life and that we couldn't do, and hung upon a cross. And that God who became man is Jesus Christ. The deity of Christ is an essential of the faith. And the eternal security that once you realized, once God has taken the veil away, and you can see with your eyes, your spiritual eyes, and hear with your spiritual ears, and you understand you truly believe, once you believe that you can never lose your salvation no matter what. Those are our three essentials that we stand by actually here on the Church of the Eternally Secure. And even if it's our mom, our parents, our loved ones, we can't really bend that truth for any of them. We can just try to help them see that truth so that they can join us in eternity. So I think at 15 years old, if I, if I heard that correctly, you're doing awesome. The fact that you care about this stuff, the fact that you're looking into this stuff, the fact that you're cracking open a Bible, that's a miracle in itself and uh, don't get puffed up, but I commend you for it. Just stay with it. Just stay in the word, stay in prayer and God will lead you. He'll focus, he'll keep you focused. So we'll be praying for you. Okay, amen. I, I, I think that uh, both Renee and Matthias gave excellent answers, but uh, I do want to give my, my thoughts on it. The, uh, the verse about uh, you'll die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he or I am. Um, whether the he was added uh, or, or, or not, um, e either way, the point is, is clear to me. Um, I actually think that uh, having the word he uh, in there 
um, is correct and um, it should be capitalized. Not, all, not every translation capitalizes anytime it's referring to God, the word should be capitalized. Like if we see Lord, capital L, it's to be understood that it's, it, to mean this this time the word Lord means God. If it means Lord little l, l, it means Lord in the sense of he, he's your master. Um, so uh, it's the same thing with he. If he's capitalized, uh, the translators are saying that this is a reference to, to being God. But we can't put too much confidence in the translators and their punctuation, their capitalization. But I think that having he in there is um, a, an important thing and for this reason. Um, if you go back uh, earlier, you know, get the context, why is he even saying this? If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. It's because there's an argument. There's been an argument going on for several chapters at this point, because first uh, Jesus says, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Uh, I, I am God is my own father. They picked up stones and they said, he says, why do you want to stone me? He says, be, they say, because you say that you are the son of God and making yourself equal with God. Um, so um, I want to talk about what the son it means. They, they took it to mean that when you claim that you are the son of God, it's making yourself equal with God. That's an important point to get. But because um, he was saying all these things that, that would make anybody come to the conclusion that Jesus from his own mouth is making claims of deity. And then he reaches this brochure and he says, and if you don't believe my claims, the claims of who I am, if you don't believe I am he who I've been claiming to be, God, you'll die in your sins. So I think that uh, that's the context for the verse uh, to be understood. If you don't believe that I am who I have claimed to be previously. And of course, at the trial uh, of the Pharisees, as the Sanhedrin, uh, he was found guilty of uh, blasphemy, uh, claiming to be God. That's, that was his sentence. It was, his claim of deity was, was the reason the uh, high priest Taurus close said this is too much from his own mouth we, he's convicted and he, they took that to mean as another claim of, of god uh so uh it's clear that jesus claimed to be god it's clear it also i have numerous videos and playlists proving the deity of christ uh, i hope you go watch those if you need more uh, verses to support this but now is it is it necessary is the requirement for salvation well jesus said in that case, that if you don't believe I am he, God, you'll die in your sins. So that, that should be enough for us to say that, yes, it's that important. Uh, and, and if you want to say, well, it's this, you can believe he's the son of God, but not God. Well, let's take me, for example. Look at me. See this? I'm a human being. I'm 100% human. I have a... My wife and I have had one child, a son, named Mark. And he, uh, guess what? My son is equally human as I am. I am no more human. I'm not superior him to him in my humanity. He is just as human as I am. That's how we need to understand this term, the son of God. If Jesus, And that's why they wanted to kill him. If he was just some claim of, of some, uh, you know, uh, using language a different way, uh, then they wouldn't have wanted to stone him over this. So you need to realize he was making a claim of deity, and he said it's essential you believe it. Uh, now, what does a person have to believe uh, to be saved? Um, Last week, at the very end of our program, we always do the, the gospel message. And we usually keep it to five or ten minutes. And we, we want to cover it thoroughly enough. It doesn't have to be an hour. But, you know, you, you could condense it out even further to maybe a minute. But uh, there are certain things we, we feel a person must understand and believe. 
And we've, we call these, these, these things the core doctrines of Christianity. And that is that Jesus is God, eternal God, almighty. He does not have a beginning. Some people say, yes, he's God, but he came out of the Father, so he had a beginning. And so, uh, that uh, no, he, when, his first, when he's first begotten, that just means he's preeminent, okay? Um, so we, uh, we need to understand that he's God because the Bible says, as Matthias pointed out, God, the Bible says God is the Savior, and only God could be the Savior. If Jesus is not God, he can't be Savior. Now, does a person have to understand that concept to get saved? Now, what about uh, working or, or faith? Well, we, our doc, the doctrine is that we're not saved by our own works, but by the finished work of Jesus. What well, the work Jesus did, he lived a perfect sinless life, and we get credit for it. We get a robe of righteousness of Jesus' righteousness covering us. It's uh, um, imputed righteousness. Uh, and then we also believe that the, the work he did in suffering and dying for our sins, he paid for our sins, so we don't have to. So this is his work. This is the work we believe that accomplishes our salvation. If he didn't die for my sins, then I still have a sin problem and I can't be saved because I, I'd have to pay for my own sins. I can't. And then, um, then the other qu question is, um, what does it mean to be saved? It means it's settled. It's finished. It's irrevocable, it's irreversible. And uh, it, we have eternal life. Eternal means it doesn't end. That means it can't be uh, get taken away from us. So these are the core doctrines. The deity of Christ, faith alone, and Christ alone, in, in his finished work. And now here's the, here's the problem. Uh, I could actually uh, encounter a person that says, I believe Jesus is God. I believe he died for my sins on the cross. He was buried and was raised from the dead. By the way, the reason the resurrection is important is because if he's dead, how can he save us? He has to be able to have victory over death, to give us victory over death. Uh, so he, he's our living savior. Uh, and, and he said that he would raise himself from the dead to give us the proof that his claims are true. So he proved it. And the Bible says that his resurrection is what get, justifies us are, are, we're justified in believing in him. He, he gave us good reason to believe in him because he proved himself. And then the, uh, uh, but I, 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 I know that there are people who will say, Jesus is God, he paid for my sins, he's raised from the dead, and yes, I believe in eternal security. But if you ask them, well, are you certain you're going to go to heaven and why? And if they can't say, I'm certain because uh, yeah, because Jesus did it all for me, and he promised it to me. That's what's the, the, the missing ingredient for so many people. Uh, I made a note. What was I going to? Uh, so the, the, the fact that Jesus is God, the fact that he paid for my sins, the fact that he rose from the dead, uh, the fact that eternal life means you can't lose it, uh, these are facts that we need to understand and believe, but here's the, here's the activating catalyst, and that's faith that he, he will keep this promise to us. See, there's a lot of people that they get their facts right, but they don't have faith that because he's God, because he paid for the sins, our sins, because he promised I have eternal life, that it's settled and I've got it. They don't have faith. They don't believe that it applies to them and they've got it and it's irrevocable. Unless they understand that and come to that conclusion and believe, everything else are just a gathering of facts. So, yes, uh, uh, to, to uh, Nick, yes, uh, now if a person doesn't get all their facts straight but believes Jesus can give them eternal life, and they believe that they have it because of Jesus, his promise to them. I don't know. Maybe they'll be saved. Maybe they don't have to have all their facts exactly right. Personally, I'm never going to take the chance because I believe that there's good reasons that we can conclude that a person needs to understand all these things and believe them all. I tell you this, if a person says, well, I, I, and I believe I'm going to go to heaven uh, because Jesus promised it to me and that's, that's it but I don't believe that he paid for my sins or I don't believe that in the resurrection or I don't believe that he's God himself, 
uh, I would say I, I can't believe that a person could be an actual Christian and a believer and reject these things because because these are uh, part of this good news, the, who he is, what he's accomplished for us, and his promises to us. All right, anybody else want to talk more about that? Okay. All right, let's um, go to another good. question then. Does anybody in the chat room have any comments? Did you observe over that? Okay. Uh, uh, the next question is uh, uh, from Roberto Garza. Uh, is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit cursing him? So he's saying, if, are, is cursing the Holy Spirit what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is? Uh, um, Matthias? No. No, it's not. Um, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, while I guess we can't really understand or know for sure exactly what it is, um, it certainly isn't just cursing. Um, just saying, oh, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. No, that's, that's not what it is. There's even on YouTube somewhere in the blasphemy challenge where they've tricked these kids into doing such a thing of saying how they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And they might even think that that is the unpardonable sin. In fact, they say, I, this is how much I don't believe I'm blaspheming. That means I can't ever get saved. So it's more of a thing to make them, to, to make people who don't seek, uh, basically, and you'll, you'll notice it's mostly kids, uh, pre-adulthood right before adulthood that are doing this and it's kind of like you know it's not kind of like a celebrity you can't sell your soul but i'm sure a couple of them have come across some tables where they uh, uh maybe sign some documents and think that they sold their soul but if they go to scripture god owns it um, and all they have to do is turn their heart to the Lord and the veil be moved, be removed. So um, the, uh, the fact that these things are out there, you can blaspheme the Lord and, and now you can't get saved or you can sell your soul to the devil and now you can't get saved. It's actually just to attack those people that actually blaspheme the Lord and so supposedly sell their soul. So that they'll think that there's no chance for them and they'll just go off into even deeper apostasy. But what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I actually think that it is dying in unbelief. I think that everybody who dies in unbelief blasphemes the Holy Spirit. I think they take away and add to the word of God and they are in unbelief. I think the three together is an unholy trinity that every lost person who dies in unbelief will do. But I think as long as somebody has air in their lungs, I don't think that you can do it. You can be in the process if somebody's rejecting God and denying him. If they keep doing it unto death, then they will have uh, have done it to where it's impardonable. But I don't think that there's anything you can do on this earth that didn't get put on the cross of Calvary. Uh, that thing that I got on the wall there is important because it wasn't just partial sin. It was every single sin that ever has been and ever will be from from even now forward, was put on that cross. So blasphemy of the Holy Spirit has got to be something that is connected directly to unbelief. So for for me, I see a, uh, God uses a triune connection. I mean, even Satan has his un, his unholy trinity of the beast, the false prophet, and uh, the Antichrist. So trying to mimic God in all that he does. So 
Um, I, I think it's sad that there are some people who have been tricked into thinking that, oh, it's something they've done, and now they can never get saved. Uh, God will never want them. And really, I think that's what's being perpetrated out there. Um, I used to think that uh, for most of my saved life, I used to think that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost was something you could only do when Jesus was walking on the earth because they looked at the things he was doing and said, Hey, you, uh, he does them by Beelzebub. So if you take scripture to have just that context of where blasphemy and the Holy spirit comes up, then you kind of have to say that it's looking at what Jesus has done and given it credit to the Holy spirit. Uh, or given get, given credit to the devil uh, rather than the Holy Spirit. So there's there's that way to look at it, and that's the way I looked at it for most most of my saved life. But the more and more I read the Bible and use the Bible cumulative to make up my doctrines, um, I do think that blasphemy and the Holy Spirit is directly connected to unbelief. All right, thank you. Renee? Yeah, uh, yeah, he, he's all right. Uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event either. It's not anything that you, you've said. That that was such a silly, it, it proves to me that whoever had that hatred for God that started that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit website channel or whatever, they are biblically retarded. They're just illiterate. I mean, they can't even blaspheme God right. They're just, you know, it just shows how little they know about scripture. The blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, like Matthias brought up, is when Jesus was doing miracles and the Pharisees kept attributing his miracles to the devil himself. So to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is for God to give you witness of who Jesus is and what he's done. And you reject it. God has opened your eyes to see and Jesus warned them. If you, you need to stop this, because if you don't, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit and you're not going to be able to come back from it. God's just going to leave you blind. So he's absolutely right. Blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is to reject the witness. The Holy Spirit is showing you of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And when you reject that unto your death, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. There is no forgiveness for that. So. Uh, and I haven't made a good point in the chat room. If you fear you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you have not. I mean, it's evidence that you haven't. So um, you, there, there's, as long, like Matthias said, as long as there's breath in you, there's hope. So uh, the thing is, though, God will keep, he's, he's patient, and he will keep giving you the witness of who Jesus is and his finished work on the cross. But how many times can you say, I don't believe that. I think you also got to do this or that before he'll just let you go over to heresy and stay blind. I don't know. That's a question. I don't know. Uh, but it's clear to me that it, it is ultimately just rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit and, and him opening uh, your eyes to who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, obviously, we, we get this question uh, every so often. Um, I, I think it's because um, there's uh, that particular verse in the Bible uh, scares a lot of people. And because it seems like, wow, if you do this, it's kind of like taking the mark of the beast or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. These things really concern people because it, it seems like, well, there's no hope for that person. There's nothing that can, can save them. Um, but I, I believe that really the correct way to understand it uh, is uh, historically. Uh, I think Matthias and Renee both referenced it that in order to actually blaspheme the Holy Spirit the way we find it in the scriptures, uh, when we have those words, he said, Jesus said, That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which won't, won't be forgiven. I think he said, in, in this age or the time, age to come. Uh, but he. He was talking, you know, you have to uh, to make a conclusion of what, what the Bible's saying. 
you need context and you need to find out what the writer intended what was the intended meaning at the time and um so the writer are saying that what jesus jesus's words so what was jesus intention at the time he was talking to uh, a, a, a little group of people a group of pharisees who were accusing him of performing miracles not by the power of god but the devil was actually working through jesus he's possessed by the devil and the devil's allowing him, giving him the power to do these miracles. And that's the setting that this takes place in. So he's talking to those people about this particular issue at that time. And he says, for you, you're actually blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. You'll never be forgiven for that. Uh, I think for you to have to really blaspheme the Holy Spirit, as we find it in the scripture, you'd have to get a time machine and go back in time actually listen to Jesus and watch him perform miracles and say, you did the miracles with the help of the devil, not God. You'd have to be able to do that to actually do it. Now, whether we do know that there is a, 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 a one thing that is unforgivable, that, are, that is unacceptable to God, and that is unbelief. If a person uh, in their entire lifetime never comes to belief in the gospel for their salvation, then uh, that will result in uh, uh, no eternal life for them. Uh, condemnation, the second death. Uh, we know that that's the only thing. All sins are paid for on the cross. So the one thing that is left for a person to do that, that Jesus cannot do for them, he did everything else, but it's up for them to trust Jesus for this salvation, believe in him for it. And um, unless they do that, they're lost. So that's the only thing, uh, faith is the one requirement so on one hand we know that faith is required and without it we're lost and then we have this verse blasphemy the holy spirit and let you can connect them i i, I can see how matthias Rene can relate that to that uh the holy spirit is trying to uh, guide someone to say to to, to faith and, and someone's keeps on rejecting it you, you might call that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I don't really think that's the intended meaning of the, the term as we find it in the Bible. But it's certainly, if you're rejecting the Holy Spirit's uh, promptings to you to try to draw you to, to, to the cross, then, uh, you know, you're, you're lost. All right. Any, any, any more on that, um, Rene or Matthias? Okay. Let's go to the... The next question, uh, this one is from uh, Patrick Stepp. What does it mean that God hates all workers of iniquity? Aren't we all workers of iniquity before we are saved? Uh, Renee, you want to go first on that? that that's a tough one. Yeah, uh, uh, of course, we're all workers of iniquity before that. Um, that you can see in the Old Testament, uh, where God, the word hate uh, can be used to mean that they're not in his favor. Like Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated. Um, but of course, we know God hates sin. Uh, and so his wrath, it says, are on those that, that aren't, him, aren't his. It says that. Uh, now, I don't know when that occurs. I'm assuming God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, so th this is a tough one for me. I don't believe God. It, it's clear. I will answer this, that God so loved the world. God loved everyone that ever did live and ever will live and sent Jesus to die for them. So I know he loves everyone and died for them all. But, of course, uh, he hates sin. Um, and this is talking about those that are of the kingdom of darkness, that are coming against his people, Israel, specifically in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it would be all those that have rejected him. Uh, and he knows that. So I, I, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, but God doesn't hate 
any person. He died for all of them. So I don't know how else to answer that. Okay. Uh, before I ask Matthias to respond, let me uh, expand on this question because I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Patrick did not include a verse uh, with his question. Uh, I'm not really sure that the Bible actually says that God hates all workers of iniquity. I don't think I'm not sure the Bible says it in that, those words. Uh, the the times that uh, the time that I know that I hear workers of iniquity uh, that I can recall is um, they Jesus said there would be a time, and he's talking about the judgment. No time when they come to me. What? I got your verse for you. Okay. Uh, Jesus said, there'll be a time when they come to me and say, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful works we did in your name. We did this and that. And then he says, depart from, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Um, uh, other than that, I'm not sure the term workers of iniquity. Maybe it's there. Uh, Renee, you have a yeah, it's, uh, it's Psalm 5.5. Five. It's David. I figured it was Old Testament. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. So it's Old Testament. It's it's people coming against his people. It's okay. it. That's what it's the, the context of it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, you you said John three sixteen, showing us that God loves everyone, and also I would say uh, there's a verse that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that verse is saying that even as we are sinners, God's demonstrating his love to us, how much he loves us. Even as sinners, God loves us. So um, um, I think you have to con really consider that. Uh, uh, Matthias, what are your thoughts on this? Renee, can you read that? Can you read yeah, that I one more time? It, I posted it right there when the foolish, I, I guess the fool in his heart says there is no God, so maybe it's atheist. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. All right, yeah. So so the foolish, we're talking about lost people, shall not stand in thy sight. When is that? Oh, that's at the judgment and when Jesus returns. So at this point, he does hate all the workers of iniquity because nobody can stand. That's why we need the imputed righteousness to stand in his sight. So at the time that somebody is where they're about to stand in his sight, if they are workers of iniquity still at that point, he hates them. That's there's nothing wrong with that. That that really isn't talking about during a lifetime when it says standing in the sight of God. That's going to happen at the end of somebody's life. That's going to happen when you prepare to meet meet your maker kind of deal. And if somebody's not does not have the imputed righteousness, does not uh, have the sinless perfection that was given to them by what Jesus did and their faith and the cross of Calvary, then they're workers of iniquity. And God does hate that. It, it, it's not like he's going to be like, ha, 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 I hate you and you're going into the lake of fire. No, that's not what it means. But he, everybody who does not have the robe of righteousness on the wedding garment they went to stand in front of the sight of god that means they are workers in iniquity and they will die the second death okay. yeah i agree with that you guys yeah um uh... Well, there's, a, there's another thing, too, that, that people like to bring up. Renee, you've, I've heard you address this many times in your videos. What about this verse? What about that verse? Where, say, Paul or Jesus will give us a laundry list of sinners, uh, liars, fornicators. I don't remember everything on the list, but you know, I, they'll have their place in the lake of fire or something. I, I don't remember exactly how the verse goes, but people take that verse to say, well, see, 
those people are going to go to hell. You can't do that. You can't do those things. Per se, they, they want to dismiss the fact that they're actually on the list. Some of those things they're guilty of, uh, lying, everybody lies. And, and uh, the other things they think they're not guilty of, uh, Jesus said, even if you had thoughts like that, you're guilty of it. So, uh, but the reason Jesus and Paul does that, he, Paul says, and such were some of you. But you're not considered that anymore because Jesus paid for those sins. Um, but uh, Jesus, when he when he gives us these things, uh, he's he's trying to show us the impossibility of of uh, your you have no hope. There's no hope for you. Look, here's a whole list of things. I'm sure you're on the list somewhere. Probably all of it. <laughs> There's no hope for you, except for me. That's why I came. So he's not saying that. Uh, that uh, sell everything you own to get saved. He's not saying stop doing this and that or cut off your hand or something you can't be saved. He's just trying to show everybody that there is no hope because the, the you're guilty. Uh, you, he's trying to show them their guilt so they, they have no excuse. They don't have an answer. They have to realize that, wait a second, I'm in a helpless, hopeless situation. And what am I going to do? And Jesus said, with God, with God, it's possible. All right. Um, the next uh, question, I thought I wrote it there. Uh, By the way, Brother Luke, I want to comment on what you just said. Okay. I've had Lordshippers bring me this verse and others like it as if they're not one of them. I love that you just mentioned they, they don't realize they're in the, the category that they just listed. They think they're, they're not one of those. So they'll, yeah. they'll the, uh, exclude themselves and just tell you yeah, all. The, the, the Lordship heretic has to be psychologically really messed up. They're actually a deluded person. Yeah. Because they think that all these other people, it's just like that Pharisee. I'm, oh, Lord, I'm thankful I'm not like these other people. Mm -hmm. you know? right. uh, but they, they can't see that uh, they're, uh, they're on the list. Uh, okay, the next question is from uh, Brother Daryl, DFX. He wrote, I have a question on Joseph in Genesis. The pastor of the new church we're attending called Joseph a tyrant for making the people sell all they had and then sell themselves to him for Pharaoh's sake during the famine. It does sound like that on the surface, but in the end, the people said in Genesis 47, 25, quote, you have saved us, unquote. Daniel Stone said in the Liberty Bible study of, on Genesis 47, that this is a picture of the gospel. I agree and see Joseph, Joseph as having saved the whole world just like Jesus would. How do we reconcile the seemingly socialist behavior of Joseph in taxing the people and turning them into farming serfs? Uh, how do we reconcile that with the picture of the gospel it has also? How do we reconcile that with the picture of the gospel it has also? I'm not sure I understand that last sentence there. Uh, okay, uh, Matthias? Why don't you go first? No. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> so I think this go gets down to what real belief is. Uh, you you don't just lolly daggly go and say, hmm, I'm just going to choose to believe this today. In fact, for some people, it's almost a battle. You've got to really reason with God. And what it boils down to always, always, is that somebody has themselves in the equation. And so different things will happen to you in life where God, and I'm talking about for a lost person, where God will be breaking down at them to where they're uh, sometimes so broken, all they have to do, they're on their flat on their back, all they can do is look up. And it's about getting yourself out of the equation and 
by the predicaments, the situation of the famine uh, in Egypt, they gave their cattle, then they gave their land, then they gave themselves. It's kind of the same thing when you're going to Jesus. It's like, I'll give you some of this, but I don't want to give you all. And then different things in life come that, okay, I'll give you a little bit more, but I'm still not going to give you all. Um, because I've still got to have a part of, of, of this somehow, some way. And then there comes a point where you're like that, that Gentile that went to Jesus. It was like, let me just have the crumbs. I know I'm nothing but a dog. I just want the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And it's like selling yourself into slavery. Like, just I'm out. Like, I can't do it. It's not me. I, I can't even figure it out on my own. And you just come to the end of yourself. You put yourself out of the equation. And then salvation happens. They were taken into the abundance of the foreknowledge of God from Joseph being able to, you know, the, the decipher the seven-year dreams. And as they said, when you're in God, they, they got saved and they know it. So trying to save themselves never did it. But them just giving up everything they had, even themselves, taking themselves out of the equation, that's what needed for them to actually believe. So I think it's more of a picture of a gospel than a tyrant. Okay, thank you. Renee? Yeah, man, that pastor really missed the mark on that one, didn't he? Uh, he he's Okay, the Old Testament, just like parables, is an example. They are samples. They are shadows and pictures that bring the New Testament to life, vice versa. So I like what Matthias saw in that. Uh, eventually, you'll give up everything just so you can live, right? They did come to the end of themselves. But Joseph's name in Egyptian is Zapanaphania, which means savior. He is such a picture of Jesus. He was... As a matter of fact, he was sold for the exact amount as Jesus. He was sold for 20 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave back then. By the time Jesus came around, the price of a slave was 30 pieces of silver. So they were actually sold for the same thing. They were falsely accused and betrayed by brethren. Uh, and they, en they endured terrible punishments neither deserved. And he ended up forgiving and saving the nation of Israel, just like Joseph. So the 12 tribes come from Joseph and his brothers. Um, I, I'm really sad to see that your, your pastor could only see the carnal side of this. He says so stuck in the, this is how people that are unsaved see the Bible. They'll look at the Old Testament and instead of seeing them as shadows of God's grace, they judge God on what he's done and how their government was so corrupt. Why didn't God change their government? Why did he, why did he say it's okay to have slaves? Why did he, they never like see what's really going on there. And that's some spiritual truth. And so uh, I like what my uh, Matthias gleaned out of the story. Uh, but ultimately these stories are shadows of Christ and what he would do. And so that's, that's all there is to it. There's so many parallels between Joseph and Jesus. He's a picture of Jesus, just like many people in the Old Testament are pictures of Jesus. So uh, it's kind of silly to get hung up on. He was totalitarian and socialist. Okay. Well, Jesus, when he came, he didn't come to reform the corrupt Roman government. He said, render unto Caesar's what Caesar's. Let them have their little time on earth. So we're not worried about these things. We're worried about the spiritual kingdom. So that, that's very upsetting. That's all he saw out of that. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can add anything. I think you both got everything out of that you possibly could. Uh, I would only say to Daryl, um, 
if I was finding a local church and I, I, that's, that's what uh, I'm hearing, uh, I'd be quite concerned about his using him as my pastor. Um, okay, the next question I'm going to take is uh, out of order uh, because it's in the chat room and uh, I'm going to move it to the front of the list because uh, it's timely. And uh, this was from High Speed Drifter right now in the chat room. Uh, how do you keep believing when you have lost a loved one? Renee? Yeah, uh, wow, this is the time you need God the most. Um, Paul tells us we are not as those without hope. We will see our loved ones again. So um, as much as, all right, first of all, I want to say give yourself permission to be human and to feel whatever comes. Um, it happens. Don't get condemned because of any feelings that you have. It hurts to be part of from someone we love, but we're not uh, without hope. So this is the time you need to draw close to God. Um, there's a verse that says God draws near to the brokenhearted and he's close to those who are crushed in spirit. So he may feel far away, but he's actually drawing close to you. And if you draw close to him, you'll be able to get through this. But it's a, it's tough. It is tough. Hey, Matthias. Right. It's a, uh, this is, uh, it's always tough to go through, through this. And especially if you're not, um, persuaded or have a good feeling on if that person who passed, especially somebody you loved, if they truly believed or not. Um, it's actually a joyful thing when you're confident in the person's confession. Uh, I just feel sorry for us saints or us people who are left behind uh, when a saint goes and they're present with the Lord. So it, I, I want to console you. Um, I, I don't know where this person that you loved, uh, where their faith was resting in. I can only imagine one way or the other would be pretty joyful or pretty saddened. Um, but how do you keep believing? It's not up to you. God's the, if you believe God, you know him. And in this time of disparity, like Renee just said, it's the time you need him most. He, it's kind of hard to stop believing in them in these times of disparity uh, when you're leaning on him. Um, you know, I, I hope you've come to the reality that God just put things in motion and he's walking through it with us. But the things that we see in this life, whether disease, sickness, um, just flat out uh, dying before time. I mean, it, it all comes from the enemy and that sin has entered into this world and that he, the enemy, is out to kill, steal, and destroy. But in everything that happens, good, bad, tragedy, joy, everything works for the good of those who believe. So um, just, I don't know how you stop believing when tragedy happens, but I get being angry at God. You can be real with, with your father. If you're saved, you can be angry at him. No, no problem. It, that, that happens to all of us if we're actually real. I mean, think about when you were growing up in your adolescence. Did you not get angry at your dad? Uh, if, if if you have a relationship, if you're real, then then yeah, that's that's normal, and 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 we'll be praying for you for lift, lifting you up. But I don't think I can give you any advice on how you keep believing. If you believe something, you believe it. If you don't, 
well, then you might have to try to keep yourself. Um, but uh, in this time, I, I'm sure uh, if you're close to God, he will pull you through it. There's times where he's walking next to you. I don't know the poem, but there's footprints right next to yours. And then sometimes you'll go back and you'll see that there were only one set of footprints. But if you're leaning on God, it's not him that went away. It's actually him carrying you. He'll take you through all the tough moments in life. Uh, and he'll use them to bring you closer to him if you'll let him. But we'll be praying for you. Well, amen. Uh, the poem, Footprints, I have like three feet away from me. Uh, I could take it off my wall and show it to you, but it might be a problem getting it back up on the wall. But if you haven't ever read the poem, Footprints, uh, it, it would, I'm sure it's a, it'd be a, a blessing for anybody. I'll just look it up and read it. Uh, now, High Speed Drifter, um, what I'm not sure about in your question is if this is actually applying to you right now. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's a theoretical question uh, or something you're going through. But uh, uh, I th think Renee and Matthias uh, covered a lot of important points. I I've actually witnessed people uh, uh, respond in completely different ways. Um, I was attending a small local congregation many years ago that uh, these people, uh, I was new there, I didn't know them, but when I first met them, everybody was explaining to me that they just lost their teenage son. And, they, and he was just, he, he just loved the Lord and, and the whole family did. And, and they're at the church and the attitude that they had was just inspirational to everybody. Uh, the the faith that they had and the, the the comfort they had in their faith and in their Savior, and uh, I, I made me think. I don't know how I would respond if I if I lost my son under the same circumstances. I um, I, I would hope that my faith would comfort me and and, and help me get through it as it did them, and also. The, the, anybody can be a witness for Jesus if they have nothing but blessings in their life. If everything's going great, oh yeah, praise Jesus. But they're praising Jesus after their son was taken at, at the age of 16 years old from tragedy and, and an auto accident. And they're praising Jesus. So um, it, it, it certainly means more to the world, to the observers, when they can see that our faith uh, helps us instead of destroy, uh, we, our faith is destroyed. Now, there are other people I've seen go through a tragedy and they react in the opposite way. As Matthias said, they get angry with God or they want to reject it and they no longer believe. Of course, choosing to and not to believe it, you know, that's a totally different subject. But I think uh, for me, I, I, I know it would not affect my, my faith. I may get angry. I've gotten angry at God myself over the last few years. I've gone through some health problems that was just like one thing after another and one complication. You give me a list of possible complications. I, I got everything on the list and I'm thinking, Lord, why? Come on, everybody's praying for me. And you're, you know, I'm not getting any help, Lord. Are you even there? I'm just thinking, I, I'm being crushed by it. And so I know that we, we're not going to all respond ideally, the, the perfect picture of how we, we should be responding in tragedy with our faith grounded in our faith. Uh, I've often talked to my friends about how we would choose to die. If it was up to us, would would I like to die in my peacefully in my sleep one night, suddenly surprised, nobody knowing it ahead of time, without any pain or suffering? Or would I rather have a terminal illness and have a long suffering death, uh, and in that time have this opportunity to praise Jesus as I'm suffering because of the the statement it, it makes to the world? 
Um, we find that in Fox's Book of Martyrs, documented in many, uh, throughout all history, it's a powerful testimony. Uh, but I'm, I'm really, uh, that's why I've already said my, uh, to everybody that I love and care about, I've already expressed it. So I don't have to think, well, I need some time before I die to express my love to everybody. And it's done. So Lord, you can take me quietly in my sleep sometime. If you, um, all right. I don't even know if that was relevant to, to this, but all right. Anything more, uh, Renee or Matthias? Okay. Uh, the next question is from Shana Madich, M-A-D-I-C-H. And Shana wrote, uh, I don't want to believe in hell. It scares me. But why are there so many near-death experiences of people who went to hell on YouTube? The majority of them see similar things and smell horrible smells like sulfur. Uh, they can't all be lying. If anyone sees this, and could respond, I would appreciate appreciate it. I'm struggling right now. God bless. Uh, Luke, uh, yes. I am uh, working on another video against these things right now. Do you mind? Yeah, I, go, ahead, go ahead, please. I, I, am, I was grinding my teeth listening to this question only because now I believe God can use supernatural revelation. Not saying he can't. Every single one of these people that have gone to hell and come back with unbiblical uh, things they experienced all have a false gospel message. And they all claim that the number one thing that's wrong is you can lose salvation. That once saved, always saved is a doctrine of devils. And there's Christians in hell because they didn't repent of enough sin. So first of all, Jesus is not going to take you on a tour of hell because he said he wouldn't in the Bible. He said they have Moses and the prophets. Even if someone is raised from the dead, they're not going to believe them. So you, you either believe God's word on this issue of judgment or you don't. Secondly, what they see has more in common with Dante's Inferno and the Greek revelation of the afterlife than it does with the biblical. So either these and not one of them are blood bought real gospel believing people another thing is they're usually selling a book so i i have looked at every one of these hell visitation videos not one is a blood bought child of god not one has the true revelation of the gospel now either they are lying flat out like that burpo guy did to sell books and they came out later that when the kid grew up, he admitted it. Uh, they told me to lie. Uh, or, and that's hard to believe, but people do that. Or they have been deceived by a lying spirit. Jesus is never going to tell you that his blood was not sufficient to purge you of your sin and that your works are needed. You better work harder and add your own righteousness to be saved. Nobody is in hell because of any sin, but because they didn't believe on the one who died for them. That's it. They Jesus plus something is nothing at all. It's Jesus plus nothing. If you're believing Jesus and plus something, you're not trusting in Jesus Christ to save you. You're trusting in yourself. Bottom line. So these people, I have yet to see one hell visitation or vision from a real gospel believer. And these people do not have the things with com that comes with an abundance of revelation. John walked with Jesus on the earth, but when he saw him in his glory, he fell as dead. Paul said he couldn't speak. It was not lawful for him to speak of what he saw or what he heard. But these people are going to come back and give a detailed history. Then Jesus in the story of Lazarus and the rich man said, no, I'm not sending somebody back from this terrible place. They have Moses and the prophets. But now he's going to send all these people that happen to believe a false gospel message to be his messengers. They're not even his. So don't let these things trouble you. False doctrine has always been propped up with supernatural revelation. You can see that in Jeremiah. Oh, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. I've had a vision. 
God said, I didn't send them. They speak of the deceit of their own heart. So you always got to test the spirits and don't let those things trouble you. You check their gospel messages, including the ones that have uh, visitations to heaven. Most of the time, those people have another gospel too. So I think they're either lying to prop up whatever they're teaching or selling, or they have been deceived by a spirit and didn't test the spirits. All right. Thanks. Um, Matthias, do you get to go next? Uh, yeah. Um, I agree with Renee 100%. I have not seen any testimonies of visiting heaven or hell where the gospel message that was connected to it was correct. Now, do I believe in hell? Yes. I do think that hell is a place that people are going to be um, dealing with the repercussions of their sin while they are waiting for the great white throne judgment. I do not think hell is eternal. Death and hell are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. They're the last two enemies to be destroyed. I do think that all the lost, even the devils, except for the unholy trinity, there's three that will be tormented forever and ever, and that's the beast, the false prophet, and the antichrist. The beast being the, uh, or the antichrist and the beast are the same. Uh, the antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself, they will be tormented uh, forever. And Satan, I think, has gone trying to um, act like what God has planned for him, that God has planned for everybody. And no, no, God's God's just uh, in the fact that um, those who have more sin are going to, I think, deal with it a little bit more. Um, those who have less sin, they're going to deal with it less. And Satan himself is going to get a punishment uh, far and beyond everyone else. So uh, the fact that there is a place of hell, I do think so. And I, I know that not everybody agrees with that, but I think it is just a partial partial or a portion of time. And when time ends, so will the torment. But um, uh, as for people going and having these actual encounters, a lot of them don't add up. A lot of them have like demons doing the torturing and Satan down there doing stuff. No, hell is a place where the devils are going to be tortured. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. So during that thousand year, like they're all flying around or messing around in reality today. They're not in hell. They're, they're that's who we battle against. So at some point in the future, they will go there for a while and they will be punished that it was created for them. But I do think that that's the place that God is using to keep the souls who are waiting for their judgment also. Uh, so, but everybody who comes back with these visit visitations, a lot of times the stories don't even add up to scripture. And then when you look at the gospel, it's, Far from it. Uh, and usually the one of the things that they're attacking the most, just like Renee said, is the eternal security of a true saint. They like to call it, you know, the one saved always say OSAS, I have OSAS, you know, but the devils always seem to attack the eternal security. Uh, and that's where it always uh, leads to there. So um, I wouldn't trust any of the things you're watching on YouTube. But get in the scripture. Uh, ask God to reveal to you about what hell is. Um, who's going there? Why? How long? And don't try to figure it out in a little sit down. It's not going to happen. Just um, discipline yourself. Ask God to help you to get into a daily reading. Try to read several times a week at least. And just know that after you've read the Bible two or three times, so we're talking maybe two or three years, who knows? But just say, God, I'll wait for you to show me. 
and um, you can listen to men. We'll give you what we see, our advice, what we see and hear. But uh, really, when it comes down to uh, um, important doctrines, because this isn't an essential, but it is important. When it comes down to important doctrines, it really is best if you get the revelation from God himself. But again, we'll be... I love these questions today because I've got a lot of praying today. We'll be praying for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Shana, uh, as I read your question again, um, I'm a little bit, uh, I need to clar clarify some things. As you say, I don't want to believe in hell. It scares me. Uh, well, that's the first thing that that that, that kind of scares me, Shana. Why are you scared of hell? Uh, do you think that you might be going to hell, or if if that's the case, then you don't understand the gospel because it's the promise that you're not going to go there; <laughs> you're going to heaven. Um, so um, I hope that's not the case. Perhaps you're scared about hell because you, there's people you love and you don't want them to go there and you don't want it to be this horrible torturous thing and, and so that's why you're scared i hope i hope they're you're concerned for others rather than yourself but uh i guess the place i'd encourage you to start is um see if you read the bible and there's very little said on it um in terms of eternal torment there's only three, four verses that people can use to support eternal torment for the lost. <clears throat> and uh, there are also, there are actually um, probably a hundred other verses, in New Testament and Old Testament, that we could find to show that there is no eternal torment for the lost. If you're unfamiliar with this, as you read the Bible, you'll probably miss it all. As you read it over and over again, maybe maybe you'll uh, you'll, you'll, you'll start to see it. But I would advise you and others to go to my playlist, what is the state of the dead? Eternal torment or eternal death? And um, the three of us, uh, Renee, Matthias and I, and many others, we've all come to the conclusion that um, uh, eternal torment is a false doctrine. Uh, the, the truth is that it's eternal death. That the, the, the lost will eventually, in the lake of fire, they perish. Now, we're not all in agreement about how, if they're going to be punished for a while or how long that will be before they perish, but we all conclude that uh, it's not eternal. They're not going to be suffering forever. Uh, so if you haven't ever heard of that concept before, then watch my playlist and you'll see why we believe that. It's all based upon what the Bible says. Um, then of course, but the idea of eternal torment really is, um, as I said, there's there's only this much in the Bible to support it. So how did it become such a popular uh, viewpoint or doctrine? Uh, it started with Augustine, and, and Augustine is responsible really for Calvinism and for eternal torment. Uh, the pictures of it, the description of it, as 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 people understand it today, and also I think Hendricks may have point about uh, Dante, the poet, uh, he wrote a trilogy, uh, The Inferno, Paradiso, and I forgot the other one, Purgatory. Uh, but he, uh, and, and much of his writings is, is saying the people in there are going to be the popes. So he was very much anti-pope, but he, he did, uh, I read Um, what's the one? What's the one about hell? He wrote. Uh, I just said it, didn't I? The Divine Comedy, Dante. Inferno. Yeah, the, the one of the three books is about Dante hell. Inferno. What, what, Inferno. Yeah, the one titled Inferno. I read that, and it was it's the hardest thing I ever read. Well, actually, it's the second hardest thing, because when I tried to read about uh, Purgatory, his other book. Uh, I couldn't read that. It was the English is just too far out there. I mean, if you think if anybody struggles with the KJV uh, style of English, you read Dante's Inferno and it, it's like English, that kind of English, but 10 times harder. 
And then if you try to read his others, uh, Purgatory, it was beyond my ability. You need other authors and books to, to actually translate almost everything he says for you, or you won't understand it, I don't think. Um, but it's very, very graphic. And a lot of the ideas that people promote today in the church really come out of Dante's Inferno and uh, the teachings, uh, writings of Augustine, not from the Bible. Um, okay. Um, any more on that before I go to another question? Yeah, we have had a lot of interesting questions today. Uh, as usual, every day, really. Okay, here's a lengthy question. So I don't, let me see. You're going to have to read along, I think, to keep up with this question. Oh, this is number nine. Nine, nine questions. Oh, let me see. Let's see. Nine questions. Oh, I guess he has nine questions for us. But I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, we'll, we'll go to answer one at a time and see how far we get here. Let me post it here in, uh, okay. Okay, I put it up there, but I don't think we got all of it. But we, we won't get through it all anyway. Let me see. Okay, this is from uh, Jonas Grumby. And Jonas wrote, questions Lordship works salvation, salvationists cannot answer. How do you know? Oh, okay. So this is this is a series of questions that he's giving us that actually are on our side to support so we can consider these. How do you know when you've really believed? Since your idea of genuine faith must be proved by works and obedience, how do you know your faith qualifies as the real thing since you can always do and obey more? What is it that really saves you anyway, your faith or Jesus, who is the object of your faith? How can your faith be validated by subjective introspection when your feelings and experiences fluctuate? And if the object of your faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, saves you, shouldn't you validate your faith only by whether it rests in him? Um, and there's nine questions like this, but these are questions that are really answers. And answers that we should have or questions that we should be asking the Lordship heretic. So that was a, uh, that was a good one. I, I remember reading all these and they're very good. So let's respond to that. Renee, uh, you want to go first to that first question he has. This is something that you sure. Yeah, I, I just copied that. I'm going to paste it and I, I hope he doesn't mind. I'll, I'll give him the credit for it, but I want to give that list to people and have these Lordship people answer it. Uh, the first one was, how do you know when you really believed? Is that what the question was? Since they're redefining what it means to have genuine faith. See, the Bible says genuine faith, uh, the believe, is that you're convinced that what God promised he's able to perform, to be persuaded that what God said is true. And so what, what believing the gospel means is believing that Christ did die for our sins. He purged them by himself that he rose again on the third day and because of that we have eternal life that's what genuine faith is it's believing the promise the report god gave of his son that he gives us eternal life and that life is in his son lordship salvationists would say genuine belief is proved by fruit the problem here is is that they're looking to themselves and their own performance which is really an issue of uh one spiritual maturity and discipleship or religious fear, because good works can grow out of religious fear, too. Just look at the Catholics under Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, you, you can't no, You can't have real security. And the people that worry me most are not the Lordship. Lordship salvation only has one of two things. Either you're going to be in constant fear, torment, and doubt, which is good because you're not saved. Because they're honest, knowing that they fall short, they could always be doing more. They all fall short of the glory of God, or they're going to become self-righteous and deceived into thinking they live up to some vague standard of righteousness and don't sin anymore. I've heard pastor one pastor say he hadn't sinned in 40 years. And I'm like, you just boasted. That was sin right there. So they're either going to be self-righteous or they're going to be tormented in fear. There's no, and 
And it's just horrible. At least the ones with fear can get honest with themselves and eventually turn to Christ in faith because they know that they fall short of it. So uh, there, there is no real way to know you've truly believed unless you get into your self-righteous mind that you've lived up to some vague standard of righteousness or have deceived yourself into what Luke calls easy, easy legalism to where you've lowered the standards of the law so much you actually think you keep them. So there's no way to truly know if you believe because the Lord Shipper has not believed. They have not believed the gospel. They have not believed on Christ. Yes. Amen. It's uh, these all nine of these points are very good questions for the Lord Shipper. You know how they always ask us questions and, you know, they, to, to argue against faith alone. Well, these are questions we should be asking back to them uh, to show the absurdity of their position. Uh, Brother Matthias, this is question number one. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I think it's great. I think it's a great uh, tool to use to point out um, if they're honest with themselves and maybe they won't be right there in front of you. It will hopefully make them think about where their faith is placed at the moment in themselves or in the finished work of the cross. So I don't, uh, I think it's great. I, I don't, I don't know if I would add or change anything. I, I don't think so. I think it's a good thing, a good point to uh, point out. And maybe this list actually should go into the description of this video. Uh, and if we all get through it all tonight, but it, the next one as well so that those watching that uh, they can use it because uh, it does from what I'm reading here it does seem like a very valid tool yes yes amen uh, yeah it's been a while since he posted this and I saved it and I, I remember I was very impressed with it and said I'm going to copy it and save it and share it so yeah it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll We'll get through all these points here, but uh, I, I think that, that, that Renee, you, you synthesized it down to this the important things, and, and that is that uh, if if a person is a Lord shipper and they think that uh, repenting of your sins, changing your life, and all all, all that will uh, your salvation is determined by believing in Jesus and all those things that you must do then they there's only two possible outcomes we know that they are lost but i'm not talking about outcome in terms of will they be saved or not where they're lost unless they repent and reject that uh doctrine uh, but uh the two things that could happen is that uh they will be deceived deluded thinking that they are the ones that are actually doing what the Lord requires, and they're in good they're in good shape. These people are deluded. Or they'll realize the uh, difficulty, in fact, the impossibility. Hopefully they come to the conclusion that the, the, it's impossible to uh, do all the things perfectly and get all the bad things out perfectly. And that, that's what's required. So it will make them uh, either totally depressed because they recognize they're failing over and over, or it'll make them realize the impossibility of this as, as a means of salvation and um, drop them on their knees uh, uh, going to Jesus instead of themselves. So those are the two possible things. They'll either become spiritual, full of spiritual pride, deceived, thinking that they are all that. Well, everybody else, so, you know, they got all these sins. What about that guy? Boy, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like these other people. Uh, that sound familiar? Uh, or they're depressed. They're always worried about whether they're saved or not, or they think they're saved one day, they think they're lost the next day. Uh, that, that kind of either spiritual pride or depression. Uh, but, but that's not what the Lord wants for us. He wants us to have uh, peace like a river, joy like a fountain. The, the blessed assurance. And if you don't have the blessed assurance, uh, I, I hate to break the, the bad news to you, but if you don't have this joy and peace and assurance that you're going to go to heaven, 
It's settled. Nothing's going to change that. And then you don't even understand what the gospel is. Uh, or even if you did understand it, you didn't believe it applies to you. So um, there's the problem. Um, all right, let's go to his question number two. Uh, is um, how do you know when you've thoroughly repented? Since you are not conscious of every sin, uh, he references Leviticus 4.2 and 5.15. Um, maybe, Matthias, if you could find that. Uh, you know, I have the entire New Testament memorized, but I don't have the Old Testament memorized. Do you believe that? <laughs> I was in a church one time visiting, and I sat down someone I, next to someone I didn't know. And they handed me a Bible because they got all these Bibles in the back of the pew. So as you train me the Bible, so, oh, that's okay. I, I don't, I've already got it memorized. I thought that was funny. Um, so find Leviticus 4.2 and 5.15. Uh, since you're not conscious of every sin, what if some sins are overlooked and not repented of? At what point do you think you've adequately repented? When your attitude changes about the sin? When you resolve to change your conduct, when your conduct actually changes, when you make restitution or ask for forgiveness, or when you are sure that there will be no repetition of the sin. And if repentance is not just a change of attitude, but a turning from sins and a change in conduct, then why does Jesus tell people to, quote, bear fruits worthy of repentance, unquote, as we find in Luke 3, 8. So that's the second question. It's a series of points he's making. Uh, Matthias, you get to go first on that one. Right, since I got the scripture, and uh, I'll say that, uh, yes, another great point that I'm glad, uh, glad that he put out there for us. Um, but uh, repentance is not a change of, uh, how did he put it? I can't really read it. I, behavior? What's that? Behavior? He, he didn't say that. He said, uh, he said attitude, I think is what he said. Yeah. Um, uh, he he but, went through a series of steps, you know. Uh, he says, when you're... Uh, at the very uh, end. At what point do you think, think you've are adequately repented when your attitude changes when you're resolved to change your conduct when your conduct actually changes when you made restitution all these do you have a do you have the access to read this i do it's just kind of far away so right. i can't That's see it i'm sorry for no, no it's, it's fine um it's fine but i do appreciate it i so i would just say that i thought he was saying that true repentance was something other than belief uh, you change your mind so I would just say that make sure that uh, if that's what you were pointing to, um, that it is uh, it is just changing what you believe from unbelief or a false belief to the correct belief. Uh, but Levit Leviticus 4.2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If the soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done, and they and shall do so shall do against any of them if they are priest and it, it goes through and it says that they're actually supposed to do a sacrifice for it which is a picture that even the sins that you don't even know you commit jesus died for them he knows he's omniscient omnipresent he knows everything and he died for it all from the foundation of the world even uh and then Leviticus 5.15 says, If a soul committeth, commits a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks and with thy estimation by shackles of silver after the shackle of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. So there, it's like they, they, they had to do the offering even though they didn't know about it it was an ignorance and daniel says something often uh that is perfect here like they want to get credit see they don't realize that god doesn't give 
credit for failed attempts at keeping the law. And so they want to think just as long as they try to do the best that they can, that they'll be all right. And being in ignorance, that, of course, then that's not them trying to. It's an ignorance. So they're doing the best they can because they're, they're doing what they can do. And that's not what the Bible says. God does not give credit for failed attempts at, at keeping the law. If you've broken one law, you're guilty of them all. I mean, I don't care. It sounds, it sounds a little rough. But if somebody lived their whole life and only said one little white lie, their whole life, which this is ridiculous. Nobody could ever do that anyways. But let's say that is. That one little white lie would be worthy of hell and death. I get a carnal understanding doesn't quite grasp that. It's got to be revealed by the Spirit of God as all holy, all pure, all righteousness. The only good that there is. Um, and these lordshippers, they just they, they don't realize that. They don't get it. They think that their goodness, they're wanting to be good, at least, let's just say, because they, you don't have to be sinless. We're not preaching sinless perfection, but you've got to want to do, you got to do the best that you can. No, they would be more accurate in preaching sinless perfection if, if uh, to be uh, going with the Bible correctly. Thing is, is sinless perfection isn't from the, just the moment you believe forward. Even if you did that, you still have all those sins from before. So it's sinless perfection from cradle to grave is what it is. So these lordshippers, they just don't get it. Um, this is a great, another great question, another great tool uh, to use. And I hope it'll be in the description if you're watching this on replay. Hey, Renee. Yeah, I, I wanted to confirm something. I love when Daniel says God doesn't give you credit for your failed attempts at the law. The law is a unit. It can't be broken into pieces. If you've broken the law, it's broken. You can never be justified by it. It's not possible. We've all broken it. That was the point of the law, to show us that we have already fallen short to schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now we need a savior. And it's either what Jesus did or what we're doing. And since it can't be what we're doing, because we, therefore we conclude a man is justified apart from deeds of the law. It can't, it's not like, you know, uh, like he said, where it's Jesus plus you trying really hard not to sin. None of that has anything to do with your salvation. And they can't seem to get that. I got one guy trolling now going, so you can just rape and molest kids. And that's all, that's his big answer to it. So you can just rape and molest kids. That, that's where they go immediately. They don't realize that even the smaller, full, the thought of foolishness is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. They think they don't. And then there's sin we don't know we commit. To do good and not do it, that's sin. To not preach the gospel to every creature, that's sin. It, there's so much we fall short of. And it, it's just exhausting to try to look at yourself and to live up to a standard you can never reach. And I really, I, I wish people could just get this. These people really think they repented of their sin. And so I asked them, so you stop sinning? You don't sin anymore? Well, no, I still, well, no, 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 no. Well, I still make mistakes. What? Your mistakes are not sin, but my, my mistakes are sin? No, your mistakes are sin. You still sin. You have not repented of all your sins. So the same standard you're telling me I've got to meet, you yourself aren't meeting it. Why? They they just have lowered the standards to add works of the law. And they've heard repent of your sin so many times to add it to the gospel that they will fight tooth and nail to say that's the real gospel. And it's not. You know, uh, it, it's crazy to me how many professing Christians hate the gospel, not just don't believe it, but despise it and work against it. Every one of those false hell visitations 
has another gospel. Every one of them. That should tell you something right there. So if, if we got to repent of all of our sin, and anyway, if we had to believe on Jesus and then stop sinning, isn't it better just to wait till the end of your life to make sure all your sins are covered? If he only covers the past sins from the time you believe. I mean, this is just confusion. To add any works makes the work of Christ of none effect. It tells us that. So I, I don't understand why people just can't get this. All of us here that are saved by grace, we love God. We don't believe in lying and stealing and hurting people. We don't believe in any of that, nor do we promote it. But there, there's none of that is saving any of us. I, I wish people could get that. I wish the word repent. And see, that's one of the ways the devil corrupts the gospel is he redefine what words mean. And that's a big one. Redefining believe and grace as something you got to qualify for. Believing is actually obedience and faithfulness. Uh, you know, repent is actually to turn from sin instead of to change. The mind. So it's just another subtle way Satan's at it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Uh, and I have a playlist titled Words Have Meanings, making that very point that uh, the Lordship heretics redefine the basic meanings of certain words to support their their uh, heretical doctrines. Um, well, a couple of points. Uh, I'll try, try to make a picture in, in, in your mind here. A lot of people object to the narrowness of our faith. Uh, that uh, well, I mean, come on. There's Christianity is not the only religion, and you know, what about all the, all the other religions? People are trying to do good in all the religions, and there aren't they really all the same? Don't they all really go to the end up in the same place? And uh, one way to understand it is that um, someone just passed away in the chat room. They lost someone just recently. And uh, we, we know if they're a believer that we say that they went home with the Lord. And if we, if a person understands that and thinks of, of heaven as being, that's Jesus's home. Heaven is Jesus's home. And how can someone who's not in Jesus's family get to go to Jesus's home? If you believe in Buddha or Muhammad or any of these other religions, and you you uh, you'd have to go to Muhammad's place or or uh, Buddha's place, wherever you can't go to Jesus' place. Jesus is home, so um, yeah, you got to be a Christian to to be with Christ in heaven. Um, that's one thing a person needs to. I think if you picture it that way, you'll see why that it it, it, it is narrow. You can't be with Jesus if you're not a believer in Jesus. The other thing is this idea of um, today, it's kind of controversial about getting um, uh, vaccinated. And there are some people that uh, are very much against it. And then there's the argument that, well, if we let some people not get vaccinated, I mean, we have cases now of, of measles that were completely removed from America. There were no measles anymore. And now, because some people would not get vaccinated, measles is beginning again and starting to spread. So uh, the the idea politically is that you've got to impose vaccinations. It's got to be imposed on people because one person has measles in, and they come into a community that will spread to everybody. So I'd like to compare heaven in that way and say that Heaven is a sin-free zone. No sin is allowed in heaven. So it doesn't matter if you have what type of sin you have. It doesn't matter how many sins you have. If you have any sin at all, let's compare it to a disease or a, an infection or virus. Uh, and, and let's say that it, it can spread. So uh, that's why... Um, there has to be a, like a sign or a barrier or in heaven saying no sin allowed. If you have any sin, you can't come in. This is an area is you have to be kept quarantined. 
Now, if someone thinks that someone's going to spend eternity in hell, you could say that's where they're quarantined. They're kept away, kept out of this sin-free zone, heaven, because we don't want heaven and those in heaven to be contaminated with this virus of sin. And you get the vaccination in this case is the blood of Jesus. Um, all right, that's, I don't know how much that relates to the question two of, of uh, this is uh, written by, again, uh, Jonas Grumby. Okay, uh, there are several more points. By the way, I will publish this. I'll send a copy of all nine of these to you, Renee, and to Matthias. I'm not sure I could put it in the description because uh, I don't think there's enough space for the statement of faith and all that. So, but well, maybe I will. But uh, anybody who wants a list of these nine questions uh, for the word shepherds, uh, as we go through these, you'll probably agree that these are excellent questions that we should be asking the Lordship heretics. Instead of, see, that's one thing that I, I, I think we make a big mistake, always being on the defensive. The Lordship say, well, what about this verse? What about that verse? And they got us on the ropes pummeling us with these verses. We, we say, well, wait a second. Let's go with the verses that are clear, explicit, that support, that, that support uh, faith alone. And if you don't think it does, then tell me, explain to me what this verse means. Let's put it back on them and make them answer our questions. Um, now, uh, I guess we just have enough time now to kind of summarize and finish up here. So we won't have a finishing song. Uh, Daniel's not with us. So uh, all we need to do is have an exhortation, a gospel message, and uh, our summary remarks. So, um, Renee uh, or Matthias, uh, would one of you volunteer for the gospel, and uh, and then the other one can give an exhortation? I've got an exhortation put together already. If Renee doesn't, Renee, yeah, that's fine. That's can fine. You, Re Renee, uh, can you tell us the gospel? I'll try. I'll take a crack at it. Okay. All right. So what we'll do first is have the gospel, then the exhortation. But but first, before each you, each of those, just summarize your thoughts on the, the time together today. Go ahead, Renee. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want me to just summarize so you can go on around? Or I you want you to summarize, then give the gospel. Okay, great. Uh, well, Matthias, to summarize and give an exhortation. It was a... Um, wasn't just one topic this week. We always do end up discussing something about salvation, but uh, there were some serious theological questions. And I'm also glad that the hell visitation visions issue was brought up because I've been cutting together something to refute another one and just to expose these things. It's harming the body of Christ so much. God doesn't give us that spirit of fear. There's no real Christians in hell. There's no, if he sent one of us to hell, we'd have to, the Holy Spirit would have to go to hell with us because he, he were sealed till the day of redemption. And uh, that also takes salvation out of God's hands and puts it in our own hands. And that's arrogant. Uh, the father gives us to Jesus. So um, it's horrible that our blessed assurance is under attack. But uh, the gospel message is the good news of what God has done for mankind. It is not a command of what we do other than receive it by believing it. And that is that Christ died for our sins. The wages of sin is death and Christ died. So he paid that wage, that sin debt we owed and then he was buried and he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. It was prophesied all through the Old Testament. Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets all point to this. And because of what he's done, we put our, our trust in what he's done for us. We have the free gift of eternal life. That is the good news of the gospel. We are supposed to preach it to every creature. It has been lost, corrupted, changed, added to. All uh, it, it's ridiculous. Paul says that uh, he can He marvels. We're so soon removed from he who called us unto grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. And he was worried that the the, the subtlety that beguiled Eve uh, would take us away from the simplicity that's in Christ. He said he came to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. And that's all anybody should know for salvation. 
So it really is that simple. If you trust in what Christ has done for you, you have eternal life and you are never going to lose it because God himself has purchased you and you are in Jesus's hand and the father's hand and the father is greater than all. So nobody's going to snatch you out of there. Okay. It was good to be with you guys this week. God bless. All right. Thank you. Uh, that gospel message is uh, a reminder to us all, but it's also for those who are not believers to understand what they really need to believe and understand uh, in order to get the gift. Now, Matthias is going to talk to those who are believers uh, that we call the body of Christ or the church and exhort us and give us some words of encouragement. All right. Praise God. Um, and also for the summary, uh, while it was really nice um, being able to go through several questions uh, this time, uh, I do I did miss Daniel and Mordecai and Leo. I mean, it was like, hey, hey none of them could make it today. But I'm just praying that hopefully um, one of them, at least, if not both of them, can make it next week. Um, uh, while Daniel's still gone and everybody keep Daniel and, and his family in prayers for travel safeties. They're going all over different places. So, uh, whenever you're lifting up prayers to the Lord, keep them in mind. And today's, I mean, the questions were just awesome. I mean, there were several of them where I will, and I know others will take upon praying for uh, the situations, the different things that uh, our, our brethren are going through. And so uh, today was just awesome. I mean, like every other one, I, I don't think there's been a broadcast of Eternally Secure. I don't think I've done a ministry broadcast where God hasn't shown me that he's using it. So I just praise him for it. And uh, I can't wait till next week, and we'll see who gets to who joins us, um, who is able to get back and uh, have time. So, but other than that, um, on the exhortation, like Brother Luke said, this is this is for saints. Uh, this is for those of you who truly know that you are His. If you don't know that. Please rewind. Listen to what Renee said again. And if you have to, rewind it again. Um, but uh, it, it's about believing. This is this is an exhortation for those who believe. Um, especially for those believers who are going through tragedy. Uh, you got to remember that God is your strength. And by leaning on him... He'll actually use this time of tragedy to glorify himself. And I know that it's hard and it's okay to be mad at, at God. Luke and I both said that earlier. I've been mad at him. It's okay to be upset with the situation. And if you bring it to him, he will bring you comfort. He will bring you peace. And if you allow him, he will glorify himself through what you're going through. And the good thing about what you're going through is not only the testimony to the world, you know, like when we suffer and give him praise, that truly gives a witness and a testimony of how good our God is. Uh, but uh, not only for, for, for that, but you also get the ability that God will use this tragedy that you're going through to help others in the future who go through the same thing. And we saw that in the chat room today and praise God for that. Uh, that even our ability to not just sympathize, but empathize with people uh, when they go through the same thing 
Like, how can you really talk to somebody who is going through having a miscarriage if you and your family haven't had a miscarriage? Different things. Uh, it, it's tough at times, but if you rely and lean on God, he'll use it not just now, but in the future to help others, to glorify him, and ultimately uh, work for the good of the kingdom of God. Uh, so the next thing I was going to point out is that the deity of Christ is very important uh, for us to exalt and a lot of us don't, I mean, we believe it. And I got to give credit where credit is due. What I'm speaking about here is uh, sort of like what Luke's talking about with, uh, I'm a Christian. Are we exalting Christ? Um, you know, how he ends the broadcasts uh, in, our, in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. Um, I've got friends who say, Jesus bless you, and others sneeze. Are you exalting the deity of Christ, which is an essential of what we believe? Are you exalting him in more ways than just, I believe it? The more you find ways to exalt him as deity, the more others will know just how important the name of Jesus actually is. So exalting his deity is, is, is a good thing. And it should be something that while we do believe it, you may have to ask God to find ways to help you to exalt it. Uh, and then the last thing that I have here is to preach. And remember that preaching is proclaim God's truth. That's what we do. God spoke it. We believe it. And then we proclaim it. And when you proclaim God's truth, we do so with boldness, charity, and patience. Especially with false gospels, especially with lordshippers. Um, the, the patience with them, like the questions that we got to be able to go over those questions with them and really reason one-on-one. -on -one. If God gives you the opportunity, the time, even to form a relationship with these people, can you do it with the charity and patience, also with boldness? Because every time we read about the Holy Spirit falling upon one of the saints in the, in the New Testament, it usually comes with they spoke the word with boldness. So these lordshippers, these decisionists, these people who claim to be Christian but just want to add them their own self into the equation one way or another until they humble themselves. And that's hard. Humiliate, they got to humiliate them. They've got to realize they're wrong. And who wants to admit they're wrong? But until they humble themselves, everything you say is going to keep going over their head. So if you can't do it in patience and charity and love, then maybe you should walk away honestly, because these people just are not going to see it. They're not. They, they, need, they need time. They need planting, watering, 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 dousing. But it has to be with, with patience. Um, so, you know, uh, don't be a hindrance to the gospel. Uh, if God leads you to just move on and look for the next one, go on. But when you come across these who just you're banging your head against the wall i get it i've been there i know i know what you i know what it's about but just patience god's long suffering is a fruit that you can bear if you abide in him um and then one last thing with this patience will come persecution and I do want you guys to start thinking about, I mean, I don't believe in a preacher of rapture. If it happens, awesome. Praise God. I'll be happy. But in this end times, I don't think we're going to be dealing with God's wrath. We'll see it. Like Israel saw the plagues in Egypt. 
uh, but they weren't affected by them. I think we'll see the wrath of God come down on this wicked world and not and, and not affect us, but we will have the wrath of Satan. Those who are, are bold, loving, and patient will eventually come to face to face with the evils of the great tribulation. And if not by the, uh, the spirit of God, um, you won't have any other words. So remember that these ti these times that we could be living in could be coming to, and, and you should start getting spiritually prepared that just in case, um, this persecution, we, we're not going to be persecuted as heroes. We're going to be bigots. We're going to be intolerance. We're going to be people who just can't see things with their own eyes and, and really figure out reality, a cancer to the beehive, the hive mind. So when persecution is something that whether we're not living in the end times or whether we are or not, it's something that God said we will have. But if we're getting close to the end times, remember this persecution is not going to come being pretty. We're going to be ridiculed and mocked all the way until that last breath is taken. Period. So, uh, through patience and love, uh, also ask God to look into the future and how would you be able to relay and uh, pass that on to those who persecute you then? Just something to think about. All right. Love you, Saints. We'll see you guys next week. Okay. Thank you, brother. Um, let me say a couple of things before I summarize. Uh, uh, Matthias sent me a question from Mike Rodriguez. Mike, uh, we, I wasn't able to answer your question today, but I added it to my list. So we've got your question on the list now. And also, I see it, saw in the chat room, uh, Brother Hendricks, um, he has a prayer need. He says, my truck has a hole and is sucking up too much air and not enough fuel and needs to replace some leaky hoses. Pray that my expenses are meager. Thanks. So, everybody, please join us in praying for uh, Brother Hendricks in that case. Uh, the talk today was wonderful as usual. I mean, I, I, mean, I, can, I say that every week. I mean, every week I'm just happy that uh, we're able to do it again. We've missed one time in 19 months now. Uh, and uh, today I wasn't feeling up to par with my energy for some reason. But, uh, I, you know, I think I think the, that saying in the Bible about, you know, you're, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're indwelled with the Spirit, you're sealed with the Spirit. And there's another one called uh, filled with the spirit. And uh, I believe the Lord fills me with, with the spirit, empowers me when I, when I need it. To, if, if I ever I have to do any preaching or teaching or anything like that, what, regardless of how I feel, the Lord strengthens me. So praise Jesus for that. I, uh, uh, I want to make a couple of announcements and remind people again. Um, we are planning on having a, um, Church of the Eternally Secure um, meetup or uh, for a weekend sometime uh, as soon as possible so within the next 12 months. And I've asked people to let me know if you I can put your name on the list as someone who is committed to coming, if at all possible. We have uh, Daniel and his family, Matthias and his family, Renee and James, and, uh, Michael, Ultimate Mordecai, Leo and Vidi, uh, fed by his rays. Uh, Jessica Dominguez, Anna, Jesus is coming, Angel Martin, Brother Dave, and Frank in the Netherlands. That's a long ways to come from the Netherlands. But, so these are the people who have said, yes, I'm making a commitment. I'm going to come to Las Vegas, and we're going to all get together and do this Church of the Eternally Secure all under one roof one, at least one time. And uh, let me know if I can add your name to the list. And pretty soon, uh, we're going to have like a little group meeting to try to 
agree on a time frame for this. So if you are interested in doing this, uh, let me know as soon as possible so I can add your name. Also, these truisms, all these sayings I asked you to, to send me, I have uh, 28 of them, and there's actually two more. I can't remember them, though, from uh, Brother Jason Jack's uh, time Friday night with me. He said, add these to your list, but I, I wasn't able to add them right at the time, and now I can't remember. So, But I have about 30 of them now. Um, there were a few more that were just too long and, and wordy and, uh, and cumbersome, but so we have 30 that I, we want to promote and get everybody using these terms and these these truisms as often as possible. So we're going to have to dedicate either a Sunday program or a special program to go through all of these. We'll publish them and try to get everybody repeating these because these are phrases that have a lot of power, a lot of truth compacted into just a few words. Um, uh, so uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is uh, don't forget to join us uh, Wednesday, 930 Eastern for the Wednesday night Bible study. And then also this Friday for the Fellowship Friday. And uh, we, we had such a good time. Uh, there were seven of us on the uh, uh, Talk and Doctrine program last Friday. Uh, the subject was uh, the, the shape of the earth. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And we decided... It, we want to do part two at least, maybe more. But so, Matthias, I'll leave it up to you to we'll figure out, you know, how soon we can do part two of that. So these are things that I uh, that will be happening soon. Join us for those. Uh, other than that, thank you for to everybody for participating today. And if you're somebody watching this uh, for the first time, uh, uh, welcome to the Church of the Eternally Secure, to the congregation. I hope this was a blessing, and maybe you'll want to join us on Sundays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Thank you, everybody, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.